Hi students, welcome to the chapter 14 lecture. Um, in this chapter I'm going to be covering how biological diversity evolves. Um, this picture you will see a eastern fox squirrel and an eastern gray squirrel, which are two species that we have in Kentucky. Um, it's interesting when you see these two species together um, because there's there are so many obvious differences in their size and appearance, and you really have to wonder um, how those two species interact in the wild when they encounter each other. Um, in this particular case, this eastern gray squirrel was climbing up this tree because it was startled, and it didn't realize that there was a fox squirrel up here um, until right about the time I took this picture. Um, and the fox squirrel is quite a bit bigger and perhaps more aggressive than the gray squirrel, and this individual promptly chased the gray squirrel out of its tree. And um, this picture is actually here because I mentioned kangaroo rats during my um, in-person course at Sky CTC, and I just wanted to show my students a kangaroo rat because I think they are really adorable. <laughs> and this particular um, individual is a chisel-toothed kangaroo rat, which is a species that lives in um, the American West, and kangaroo rats are an interesting case of mammalian adaptation to dry environments, and some species can actually go their entire lives never having to drink water, because they derive all of the water they need from the seeds that they eat. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started now that we've um, gotten the cute rodent explanations out of the way. What exactly defines a species? I've hinted about this before, and I think I actually mentioned the biological species concept. Um, anyway, it's easy to tell the difference between a dandelion and a rose, for example, but what about subtle differences between species? The biological species concept is one way to address this issue. And it defines a species as a group of populations whose members have the potential to interbreed with one another in nature to produce fertile offspring. So, <clears throat> excuse me, note that the offspring produced in this case also have to be capable of producing offspring. Um, if the offspring are not capable of producing their own offspring, then it would be a evolutionary or biological dead end. Um, here we have pictures of two different meadowlark species. We have the eastern meadowlark and the western meadowlark, and they both inhabit North America, and they're incredibly similar looking. In fact, even expert birders have a very difficult time differentiating between the two, and usually um, range alone is going to be the best indicator of which species you're seeing. So. How can we even say that these are different species? And on the contrary, how, how can we say that all human beings are one species? You see an incredible amount of diversity in phenotype with humans. The biological species concept is the most commonly used system of designating species. However, other definitions of species exist, um, including the phylogenetic species concept, and it really just depends on the context and the questions being asked. For example, fossils present a special case. How can you say that these two fossils belong to organisms of the same species? For example, because you have no idea if those are extinct, whether or not they were able to produce viable offspring together. So what mechanisms keep species separate? Well, there are reproductive barriers between species, and a reproductive barrier is anything that prevents individuals of differing species from interbreeding. There are prezygotic reproductive barriers. This just means before the zygote, and it's defined as barriers that prevent a fertilized egg or zygote from being produced in the first place. And then there are post-zygotic reproductive barriers. Of course, post just means after, so after the zygote, um, these barriers 
come into play after organisms have actually produced a zygote, but they prevent that zygote from maturing and reproducing. These are examples of prezygotic barriers. We have temporal isolation. Temporal, of course, just refers to time scale. So here we have an eastern spotted skunk, which are a sensitive species here in Kentucky, um, and a western spotted skunk. And their range actually overlaps. But the prezygotic barrier that keeps them from mating with one another is that they mate during different times of the year. One mates, um, I believe, in late winter, and the other is during the spring. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So even if these skunks were to encounter one another in their shared um, range, they're not going to be mating with one another because they are reproductively active at different times of the year. We have habitat isolation as another example of a prezygotic barrier. Um, there are many species of garter snakes, and many of them overlap in range, but they'll use habitat differently. So some are more aquatic than others, and some are more terrestrial than others. So that would be an example of habitat isolation. Behavioral isolation is another barrier to organisms um, successfully reproducing. And one of the best examples of behavioral isolation, I think, is with birds. Some birds, um, it seems particularly shorebirds and um, cranes, as well as these blue-footed boobies, have really ritualistic and complex um, behaviors that they perform that helps them to identify one another as the same species. And if one of these birds um, were to perform some sort of novel behavior that's not normal for their mating dance, it would probably be rejected as a mate. So if it's not that same species, it's going to have different rituals and it will not be accepted as a mate by the other animal. Um, we have mechanical isolation. In this case, there's these two snails. They look very similar, but their reproductive structures are actually um, not compatible with one another. And then we have gametic isolation. So, of course, there are marine organisms that will release um, sperm cells, for example, and if those sperm cells do not meet up with an egg cell for whatever reason, um, then there's not going to be any offspring produced. These are some examples of post-psychotic barriers. Um, so we have reduced hybrid viability. In this case, this is a salamander that is a hybrid, and it was um, produced, of course, through the mating of two different species. And these hybrids are actually much more delicate and just not as well suited to their environment. So that individual is not likely to survive and reproduce. We have reduced hybrid fertility. Um, an example of this is when you cross a horse with a donkey, you get a mule, and all mules are sterile, so they are not able to produce offspring themselves. So that is, <clears throat> excuse me, an evolutionary dead end in that case. And the only reason that we have mules, of course, is because people will deliberately cross horses and donkeys. But that um, sort of hybrid would not survive in a wild population. And then we have hybrid breakdown, which is similar to um, reduced hybrid viability in the fact that um, the hybrid organism here, in this case, this plant, I believe it is a wheat species, is just um, much less well adapted to its environment. And as you can see here, it's quite small, and it's not going to be successful at surviving and reproducing in the environment. Okay, let's cover some mechanisms of speciation. So now that we've gone over how species maintain species lines, how do species become species in the first place? Well, a critical event in the formation of many new species, 
occurs when a population is somehow cut off from other populations of the parent species. Um, and it's usually not as dramatic as, say, the events that occur in the animated children's movie A Land Before Time. It's not usually an abrupt physical cutoff like that. Um, but we'll go over some examples of what this mechanism of speciation can look like. So with its gene pool isolated, the splinter population can follow its own evolutionary course. And reproductive isolation can result through allopatric or sympatric speciation mechanisms. So here we have an original population of fir trees. Now over many, many years, as in thousands if not millions of years of geologic time, a mountain range arises um, probably through plate tectonics, and what ends up happening is it isolates two populations of fir trees. And over time, perhaps because this mountain range creates a rain shadow, there are going to be certain characteristics that are more favored on one side of the mountain range than others. Um, perhaps um, it's drought resistance or reproduction by way of um, frequent but low intensity fires. So we're going to have this separation that occurs and it's going to lead these two populations on their own distinct evolutionary paths, despite the fact that their original population was comprised of the same genetic material. So this would be an example of allopatric speciation. Allo means other, so this literally means other land speciation. Then we have sympatric speciation, which there's no actual physical barrier that forces um, the populations to diverge. There's going to be genetic changes within this population that make some trees basically diverge on their own evolutionary path. And over time, they become different enough that there's no um, crossing of genetic material. So here's a real life example of allopatric speciation. Um, and it, it occurs between these two species of antelope squirrel, which is a type of ground squirrel. The initial barrier to gene flow with allopatric speciation is a geographic one that physically separates the splinter population from the parent population. So we have two different species of ground squirrel that live on opposing sides of the Grand Canyon. Again, they look very similar. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But because these are different species, even if you were to translocate a few individuals of the species Heresii to the other side of the Grand Canyon with Leucurus, they were not successfully interbreed. And that is the true test of whether or not speciation is complete. Um, has enough time gone by that this one species is no longer compatible with this other species. So if the answer is yes, then speciation is complete and those are indeed considered separate species, which since these are classified as separate species, allopatric speciation was complete in this situation. With sympatric speciation, again, there's no physical barrier between the splinter population and its parent population. Instead, the splinter population develops into its own species in the midst of its parent population. And this can happen in a number of ways. One of those ways is an accident occurring or a chance event occurring during cell division that results in an extra set of chromosomes um, being present in those cells. And this is a common route to sympatric speciation in plants. The new splinter population or species now has polyploid cells, meaning each cell has more than one set of chromosomes and it can no longer reproduce with its parent species. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause here and I'll pick up in the next recording.